own. Embraces some of the wider national issues that drove the post housing programme and hopefully explains a little as to why the range was so special and why it had such a, an impact on that first generation of tenants. Many, many of Lynch's first tenants came from the slums of central Edinburgh. They came from the likes of the High Street, Canagate, Greenside, and the Pleasants. It can't be overstated, it can't be overstated the impact it had on their lives. For many, it was transformational. They moved from often dark, dingy slums in the centre of Edinburgh to a garden city in the countryside. The photograph here is of uh, Greenside. Um, Greenside uh, is at the foot of Common Hill, just behind the Playhouse. Um, in 1961, the Scotchman newspaper described Greenside as having the worst slums in Edinburgh. Five generations of my family lived in Greenside, my four older brothers were born there. And many of the tenants from the uh, that first generation came from slums like this to Houses like this, and I think you can see just by that the two contrasting images the impact that that might have on people. Now, the vision that helped create them actually emerged from that post war consensus. Uh, that post war consensus was shared right across the social class and political spectrum in Britain. In 1942, we had the Beveridge Report which identified the five giant evils of society. One, disease, ignorance, squalor, and idleness. The momentum for change had been building up since the First World War, the Floyd George's famous speech about creating a land fit for heroes. It was a long time coming for a lot of people, and that there was progress in the 1920s and 30s with the introduction of the Weekly Housing Act, which built hundreds of thousands of houses for working class people across Britain. Oh, sorry, back. I'd like to talk a little bit about those pre-war conditions. You had festering slums, you had poor sanitation, you had outside communal toilets, no bathroom, no hot water, you had overcrowding. It was a very challenging environment to raise a family in. And I personally can't, I can't even begin to imagine what it was like for my grandmother bringing up 13 children in conditions like this. There was poor health care. You didn't have the lifelong universal health care that we have today. There was mass unemployment in the 1930s uh, and political <coughs> instability and security. You had the rise of fascism in Britain and here in Edinburgh we had our own demagogue to contend with. Poverty in the 1920s and 30s meant malnutrition it meant rickets, it meant barefoot children. They had educational disadvantage. The mass of working class people were discriminated against by Scotland's then educational elite. But things did change here in, in the ancient had the Garden City. In 1944, the Scottish Housing Advisory Committee that had been set up by the then Secretary of State for Scotland, Tom Johnson, issued a report planning for our new homes. So in the middle of the war, and this country is facing all this destruction and mayhem, the country was planning for the future. And this report contained all sorts of rec recommendations for the design and layout of houses. And to the credit of Edinburgh Corporation, many of the recommendations contained in that report were reflected in the, the design and specification of the village itself. And it's already been touched upon. In 1946, the corporation launched an all Britain competition. It has to be emphasised, it's for the design of housing and the community. The design was widely acclaimed, it's been written about ever since. And in the year I was born, 1954, it was awarded the Salt Parish Science uh, Prize as the best local authority for in Scotland. I'll touch a bit on the scheme here, but I don't want to uh, replicate too much of what Stephen said. It was, a self, it was designed as a self-contained community, and so shops, so in community and recreational facilities. And many people will still remember just down here about bowling greens, about tennis courts, about pitch and pub. 
and round the corner here we had the Lane Coast Pitching Pub course. You know, so it was, it did have facilities. Um, it had open spaces throughout the for children to play in. And that, that again, that was something that Stratton Davis specifically developed. You had this lovely parkland. I mean, it has to be emphasised that parkland and the house was part of the design specification. And Stephen has touched upon it. It wasn't just the house, it the entire area was part of that specification. We had our own primary and secondary schools. Um, then secondary was right in the heart of the community in Walter Scott Avenue. Um, then primary was, was built in a park on a hill. It's absolutely a fantastic environment for a young person to be educated in. And not only did we have this lovely garden city, it was in those days it was sited by and large in the countryside. Now to the south you had the Kingston Clinic, you had the golf course. To the east you had the, the roots of Craig Miller Castle Estate and agricultural land. To the north of the houses you had the park and more agricultural land. To the west you had plain fields. You know, many of which have been purchased by the council for the residents of the village and the surrounding area, and even more farmland. And then you have Liver and Downs, the Blackford Hills and the Braids. You know, the, the range for children in those days was phenomenal. Young boys would disappear off to the Blackford Hills in the morning and not arrive home until late afternoon. So, if I, if I can try and summarise that, that mood, uh, what it was like for that post-war inch generation. You had the post-war optimism. I mean, the, the, the war had ended and there was much relief about that. You had the spirit of 45 where anything was possible. There was greater stability and security. Employment opportunities were growing by the day. We had improved health care. And it wasn't just the introduction of the National Health Service. The mass immunisation programmes in the 1950s against once two common diseases like polio and TB. We had improved educational opportunity. It has to say not for everyone, but at least it was a step in the right direction. And many working class children were able to take advantage of that. And then all of this, and you had this absolutely massively improved living environment. All of these things came together to give a real boost to the life chances of that first inch generation. And one final observation. Um, it didn't happen by accident. Market forces didn't drive this social change. The invisible hand of the market had no part to play in formulating government policy. This happened because democratic society decided to build proper houses and a proper environment for its people. And not that well.